late last week we looked at The Evil Within 2 on PlayStation 4 and found it to be a dramatic improvement over the original game, with a smoother frame rate, greatly improved visuals, and reasonable loading times. Now we have two other versions of the game to look at, the Xbox One release and the PC version. Each comes with its own drawbacks, but the results are still markedly improved over that original game. Before we jump in though, one of the chief complaints aimed at the PS4 version last time was the lack of PS4 Pro support, which left us wondering about Xbox One X support. Thankfully, a Bethesda employee recently clarified that support is indeed coming to both platforms, so look out for that. So how does it fare on a regular Xbox One then? Well, at first glance it looks rather comparable to the PlayStation 4 version, but with some additional blur. The reason for that lies in its use of dynamic resolution. The game regularly adjusts its resolution with variations between 1600x900 at the top end to lower resolutions such as 1440x810. Thankfully, the temporal anti-aliasing helps conceal harsh aliasing, but the end result is a blurrier overall game. Textures do lose some detail at a distance as a result of the lower resolution, and the game just appears softer all around. It's not clear if the shipping version already supports Xbox One X, but if it doesn't, it'll be interesting to see how this behaves without a patch. Knowing how it works, it seems that the dynamic resolution will simply sit comfortably at its maximum setting, which appears to be 900p. Of course, proper Xbox One X support should push the resolution far above this. Beyond resolution though, the Xbox One version looks mostly the same as the Sony counterpart. Both PS4 and Xbox One have noticeable LOD pop-in from time to time, with these rocks being the single worst example I could find, though trees and foliage feature obvious pop-in as well. Keep in mind that this mostly only applies to the Union Hub area, however. Once you step foot indoors then, the two versions appear virtually identical, aside from resolution. The texture work is the same, lighting and shadow resolution is on par, and the effects work is equal. Which is to say, both versions do look dramatically better than the original game, as I suggested earlier. Evidence does point to this engine being based on id Tech 5, but clearly the development team has implemented a huge number of major improvements and changes to create something that is markedly different. Unfortunately, when we jump over to performance, things aren't quite what we had hoped. Basically, The Evil Within 2 struggles to maintain its target frame rate. The drops are relatively minor, but they are often sustained for long periods of time on the Xbox, which results in more noticeable judder. The game just does not feel as smooth to play as it should. This area here, where we emerge from the marrow to face down a boss, highlights some of the worst slowdown we've seen, with dips to the mid-twenties as this creature begins to emerge from the ground. These dips are not temporary either, this entire area struggles to maintain a stable level of performance and remains basically as you see here. Out on the streets, things start to look somewhat better, the frame rate still dips at points, but we also enjoy moments where it jumps up to a steady 30 frames per second instead. Of course, as with the visuals, it's still much nicer than the original Evil Within, so if you could tolerate that game, this shouldn't be much of an issue, but it is something to note. And keep in mind that the footage we're looking at here was captured using the Xbox One S model, which might yield ever so slightly faster results than a base Xbox One. Clearly, even without a patch, playing this on an Xbox One X should clear up these performance problems, leading to a stable experience. Which means if you're an Xbox owner looking to enjoy the Evil Within 2, and you're planning to buy an Xbox One X, I would recommend waiting until that console drops to play it. Otherwise, you might want to pick up the PS4 version. In general though, indoor locations do at least tend to run without a hitch, but just about every scene outdoors, such as Union's Hub and everything leading up to it, sees an average frame rate just below 30 frames per second. For comparison, here's how the Xbox One stacks up against the PlayStation 4 version. This scene was heavy on the PS4 already, and on Xbox, it drops even lower. The number of enemies on screen and the effects in use clearly have an impact on performance here. But if we rewind a little bit, even to this scene here running through the woods, we still see performance dips on Microsoft's older console in line with the previous clips, and this particular section lacks any sort of enemies or real interactions at all, it just runs slower. So in general, 
Xbox One offers visuals on par with PlayStation 4, at least in terms of assets, but it operates at a lower resolution with a lower frame rate. If you have the choice between the two and are not planning to buy an Xbox One X, clearly the PlayStation 4 version is the better option here. And now we come to the PC. With the right hardware, the PC version of the game can stand well beyond either console release offering improved image quality and faster performance. But that doesn't mean there aren't hoops to jump through. Simply put, this is a very demanding game if you're aiming for high frame rates. Of course, if you're content with 30 frames per second, it's still possible to enjoy the game with visuals beyond the console release, but the performance isn't quite what we had hoped for. Let's start with the basic feature set though. The options menu is packed with goodies. The best feature is the inclusion of a field of view adjustment, something lacking from the console release. With an increased FOV, the viewpoint feels a lot less constrictive, making for a more enjoyable gaming experience overall. Though we did stick with the default FOV for most of this footage, just in case there were console comparisons to be had. Then there's the basic stuff like resolution. We have support for full screen borderless window and windowed modes, and even better, the game does properly support ultra wide resolutions. Then there's the detail options which are buried down here. They are plentiful, but ultimately not that useful. Some settings such as shadow detail show a significant difference if you look closely. The higher quality shadows are more defined and sharper, but it's not necessarily a transformative difference. This is certainly one area where the PC version has an advantage over the consoles. Depth of field sees a range of changes as well, though arguably the top settings are somewhat interchangeable in terms of rendering quality. The bokeh effect is quite nice and it appears both while aiming and during cutscenes. Of course, you also have the option to completely disable depth of field if you choose. You also have the option to disable things like the camera blur or the object motion blur. Both are separate options. And while I am a fan of both options, I know that a lot of PC gamers are not into camera motion blur, which is a good thing in this case because it does seem to have an impact on performance. While you can adjust options individually, there are four main presets here, and if you stack them up against one another, it becomes clear just how little a difference it really makes. Yes, LOD pop-in is reduced in some scenes, and we lose some of the detail and reflections and things like that, but the look of the game is only slightly enhanced by increasing the detail. Which is why it should come as no surprise that lowering these settings only has a minor impact on performance in most cases. In general, we're talking maybe 10 frames per second at most from ultra to low. And performance is precisely the most important thing to discuss with this port. For this video then, I've decided to approach this from the perspective of obtaining a consistent frame rate across three different PC configurations, which might line up with some common gaming rigs. At the top end, we have the 5820K paired with the Titan XP, which certainly is not a common configuration, but in the mid-range we have an i5-3570K paired with both an 8GB AMD RX 580 and the venerable GTX 970. Let's kick off with the high-end option just to establish a baseline on how the game works in a best-case scenario. I started the game by going straight for 4K with the Ultra preset and the 30FPS cap disabled. The results are disappointing, but not entirely unexpected. Performance is playable, but nowhere near holding 60 frames per second during gameplay. But fortunately, if we do enable the 30 FPS cap, it is now possible to enjoy the game at 4K with maximum details enabled. The performance remains very consistent in this mode, and image quality is greatly improved over the console release. I tested this with reduced clocks as well, bringing the Titan in line with the 1080 Ti, and 4K 30 was still completely doable here. But come on, 30 frames per second on a Titan XP, that's not going to cut it for everyone. So can we actually get to 60 frames per second? Well, this is where the problems start to crop up. Whether running at 1080p or 1440p, the Titan XP can reach 60 frames per second with ease. But unfortunately, there's an inherent stutter present in the game that keeps it from feeling entirely smooth. No amount of fiddling with the settings seems to clear this up either. Looking over at the hardware monitor, I noticed something curious. There are spikes on the frame time graph that appear with startling regularity. Here's the thing, this happens even when the game is sitting at a pause screen and whether or not the 30fps cap is enabled. These blips manifest as minor stutters in the game and detract from the fluidity of the experience. So at this point, we've really had a hard time getting to a rock solid 60 frames per second even using top end hardware. It's close, but the game simply doesn't like to run at 60 frames per second. 
So how do the other cards fare then? Well, for the next one we're looking at the RX 580 from AMD. This is the 8GB MSI version. In this footage I've disabled the 30fps cap to determine how much headroom we have. At 1440p it's clear that 60 frames per second is off the table. But the data we have here is useful in determining if we can hit that stable 30 frames per second instead. And based on testing, the RX 580 seems to offer a very stable 30fps experience at 1440p using the high preset. Small dips are still possible in select circumstances, but overall, this should net you improved image quality over the console versions while retaining stable performance. It's not a bad way to play. Now, if you want to push things up to a native 4K, the game dips into unplayable territory with a frame rate that rests comfortably in the mid-20s. And yes, the system is outputting 4K60 and not 4K24 here. It's simply all the poor GPU can muster in this scenario. Clearly, 4K is off the table for the RX 580 in this specific game. But what if you want 60 frames per second instead? Well, after our experience with the Titan XP, it's not entirely surprising that the RX 580 isn't really able to get there either. Now at 1080p, we do actually get rather close to hitting the 60 frames per second mark, and it's mostly very smooth, but it still feels like the game is not taking full advantage of the GPU. And here's a look at the game running with the Ultra preset on the left, and the lowest settings on the right. You really don't lose that much performance by going to Ultra. So how about the GTX 970 then? This classic GPU is starting to reach an old age, but it can still run plenty of modern games. Unfortunately, the Evil Within 2 is one of those games which gives the 970 some trouble. In this case, your best bet is to play at 1080p with the 30fps cap engaged using the Ultra preset. Not too far off from the PlayStation 4 version. Yep, with the GTX 970, the best you can expect is a boost in detail over the console release if you're looking for a stable frame rate. So we were curious then, what if you drop the settings to low and go for an ultra low resolution like 720p? Well in this case we do actually get to 60 frames per second most of the time. Even then, when effects like flames and explosions kick in, the frame rate can still drop. Just for good measure then, we also tested the 970 at a native 4K and the results are as disastrous as you'd expect, but it makes sense in this case. You see, the Evil Within 2 is quite a VRAM hog, and 4K demands more than 4GB of VRAM. The Titan and 580 both meet these requirements here with 12GB and 8GB respectively, but the 970 only offers 4GB of VRAM with 3.5 of that being of the faster variety. We're basically exceeding what the card can realistically handle here. Ultimately, between the three, it's clear that the game does have issues with hardware utilization. GPU and CPU usage is inefficient compared to most of the PC games, and there is an inherent stutter issue here present throughout the game. It's almost as if there's some sort of internal tick rate that might be causing these issues. Either way, there's more work to be done here. Looking at all three versions then, the results here are ultimately fascinating. The PS4 version currently lacks pro support, but offers very stable performance and solid visuals. If pro support is delivered as promised, this should be a great console iteration of the game. The Xbox One version though is rather rough in comparison, but Xbox One X support should hopefully clear all those issues right up. Just take caution if you're planning to play on a regular Xbox One, as the performance really isn't up to snuff right now. The PC version however is the most troubling port. If you have the right hardware, an experience beyond the console versions is certainly possible, but reaching a stable 60 frames per second just isn't feasible in most cases. It's a decent but highly demanding port that does not fully exploit the power of the platform. Hopefully future patches can greatly improve upon performance, but we'll see. Still, even with all these rough edges, The Evil Within 2 is a massive improvement over the original game and well worth playing. It's a beautifully made horror game that feels like a spiritual follow-up to Resident Evil in a way that the original Evil Within did not. I loved both of these games, but this second one is simply more cohesive and refined overall and well worth playing. That's all for now though. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and follow us over on Twitter. And until next time, this is John signing off. Freeze! Who are you? What are you doing here? Hold your fire! I'm a human! Sorry about that.